and, and it closed. closed. We just failed a no-go gauge, guys. Okay, so, uh, hey, Carson. Turn your How many rounds have been shot now? 1,500? 1,500. 1500. Okay, so we're at 1,500 rounds, probably about what the other rifle had, and uh, it closed on the no-go gauge, so that concludes the shooting portion of this video. We're gonna still talk about some stuff and beat some, bang on some pins and stuff like that, but uh, so uh, yeah. there we are. Hey guys, welcome back. So today I wanna to try to do a quick overview video that talks about the testing of the new Century Arms Vishka rifle that took place down in Camden, Tennessee with James Yeager. I was online on social media, I believe it was Instagram, and I saw James make a post inviting any YouTuber that has a following online to come down and videotape the 5,000 round test that he intended to do with the Vishka rifle. I took him up on it, and as far as I know, I'm the only YouTuber that actually took him up on the offer. So Jason and I packed up, went down to Camden, Tennessee to bear witness to the testing that they conducted. We had no hand in the setup. We had no hand in any part of the testing other than just to be a witness, and I did fire the first magazine out of the test rifle. So first of all, let's talk about what the Vishka is. The Vishka is a second generation rifle based on the earlier RAS 47 AKM developed by Century Arms. It's a US produced rifle. And this rifle had some fleas in it. It's been well documented online, mostly by owners, but by other reviewers that are honest. Uh, the guns have, I've seen them go off out of battery online. Um, I've watched the stocks crack and break off. Uh, we, we've seen premature wear on the bolt, just a whole just, just a whole smorgasbord of issues with the original RAS-47. Most would agree this rifle probably won't make it to 10,000 rounds. Much um, testing has been done online and, and I've seen failures before 5,000 rounds of the RAS-47. So the RAS-47 was Century's first foray into the um, AKM market of a presumably 100% US made AK by them. So what they wanted to do was improve upon that original design, which makes sense. It's good to see a company trying to improve those original designs. And that improvement has manifested itself as the VSKA, or Vishka, as they tell us to pronounce it, rifle. There are some differences between the two guns that I'm going to try to go over here in the video before we get into the test results that we witnessed down in Camden, Tennessee. The original RAS-47 has a nitrided finish. So it has this gloss black finish. It has a nitrided barrel. And internally, there's flashing marks on parts like the bolt carrier and trunnion and things like that that would indicate, at least seem to indicate, that many of the parts in this rifle are cast from different types of steel. Now, the big claim to fame with the Vishka is that though some of the critical parts, like the bolt carrier, are now made out of S7 tool steel. And you'll see all the talking heads online repeating the exact same talking points. It's a highly impact resistant tool steel and it's used in jackhammer bits and things like that. And um, so these guys are just regurgitating the talking points that would seem to imply that this gun is exceptionally more durable than the original RAS-47 design. So the, now you'll notice if you jump forward also, one feature of the RS-47 that jumps out at me that's absent on the Vishka is this standard AKM accessory rail. This has been deleted from the new Vishka for some reason, and we'll talk about that here when we start taking a look at the features of the Vishka. All right, so let's jump into the Vishka. Both these guns have about the same retail price, right around $629 as a real uh, dealer price that I see out there online. This gun does not have any nitrided components that I'm aware of. So the receiver's not nitrided. The barrel, which is 4150, is no longer nitrided. And to me, that's a problem. If you're looking at using import ammunition that's made of a bimetal bullet, has a mild steel case jacket on the bullet, there's a reason, reason why Comblock countries use chromed barrels. And that's because they resist the damage that is, can be done by a bimetal bullet on a barrel. And without having that chrome plating protecting the barrel, you can get premature wear. So you just have a straight up 4150, non-chrome lined, non-nitrided barrel in the new Vishka. The RS-47 has a nitrided barrel. Nitride 
um, if done properly, can act much like chrome and protect that rifling and extend the service life of the barrel. So I'm not too impressed with the barrel. So they've cheapened the barrel by not nitriding it. We no longer have a nitrided receiver. We now have a standard military parkerization, which is fine. You don't need to nitride parts like dust covers and receivers. It can actually be a bad thing. Uh, DDI ran into that when they were nitriding their very first guns. The, the hardening around the rivet holes and stuff would cause cracking in the receiver, so they stopped nitriding their receivers. So you want to be careful. The, the AK is intended to flex and bend when it fires. If you look at one being fired in slow motion, and nitriding makes a very hard surface and can cause problems. So the fact that this is not nitrided on the receiver shouldn't be a problem. It actually should be an improvement. So now we get into some of the S7 components. Now the bolt is not S7. The bolt itself, I think it's 4140 steel. And here's the bolt. The carrier looks very much like an RAS 47 carrier. I see uh, flashing marks on the carrier, which would seem to indicate that this is a cast part that's in final machined, but this is presumably an S7 component. All right, so you have an S7 carrier and a 4140, maybe 4150, but I believe it's a 4140 bolt inside, okay? The trunnion on the Vishka, I believe this is an S7 component as well, which has your locking lugs. And you have two locking lugs on the AK. You have one over here, and you have one over here. And so that, I believe, is an S S7 component. And then the feed ramp, they claim, is an S7 component, but feed ramps don't take much of a battering, and it's just kind of part of the front trunnion anyway. So that's the biggest differences between the Vishka and the RAS-47. You'll notice over here there are some extra rivet holes. That's because it looks to me as though Century is using existing RAS-47 receivers and leaving off that little $10 side rail to save money probably, and then they're just filling the holes that have already been drilled into the receivers with rivets or plugs. So you have extra holes on the receiver. Uh, it's, it's ugly. I would pr prefer that they simply put the accessory rail on there. Um, so anyway, we've, we've cheapened the finish, we've cheapened the finish on the bore, we've deleted this part, and yet we have the same price. Now maybe the S7 tool steel costs more than whatever steel they were using in the previous components, but I can't imagine that $10 savings being that significant. I would rather just have the part. All right, so everything else on the gun seems very reminiscent of the RAS-47. So let's talk about what actually happened down in Camden, and we're just going to we're not going to show you the entire video. I'm going to put a link down below to the entire video that Jaeger posted so you can see every single round fired. The Vishka had, well, they had two Vishkas out there when we first arrived. They had one that they had already fired 1,000 rounds through, and then they had one that was new in the box. So just getting ready to uh, set the test up, and what we were doing is just going through making sure that both the firearms here passed um, a no-go gauge, go, no-go gauge, and one rifle's been fired, one has not. The one that has been fired, we put the no-go gauge in, and it closed on the no-go gauge, which means it shouldn't be shot. I uh, don't have a field gauge here. And so then we actually took the rifle and banged it on a rock, and we can actually see a small line that's about a thou, maybe a couple thou, appearing on the top of the barrel here, the barrel setting back into the trunnion. And so when we do that, we can get it to pass the, uh, the no-go test. But as soon as we bang the bolt home, it pushes that barrel forward again. And so there's something it, that wrong with the assembly. Should, that should not be possible. Right. Um, it, like, it, it should not be, po like there would have to be, for it to happen, broken pins coming out or something like that. Uh, so because when the barrels, mashed into the trunnion, then the holes are drilled. So like, it's not like lined up or something like that. It shouldn't be. Right. <laughs> and then the rivets are mashed in. And uh, so I don't know what's going on. And uh, I don't know. So we're gonna see if we can drive this barrel pin out with just a punch and a hammer. But we definitely can't shoot that rifle safely. Yeah, right. So what we will do is we will uh, continue with the test with the with the gun we weren't going to shoot uh, that does pass the the no go test. So and uh, weapons clear. So I'm taking no go. We're not doing this exactly right, but I'm going to go ahead and 
try to pound it home. You can see that the bolt carrier doesn't go home. We've measured this distance and documented it. So we know exactly what the headspace is currently. So if this tightens, it means it's going out of spec and moving towards what that one currently is. And if that starts to happen, I would suggest stop yep. shooting the gun. Yep. The intent was we had learned when we got there was to fire the 5,000 rounds in testing through the gun that already had 1,000 rounds through it. So it would have a total of 6,000 rounds fired through the gun. When we had gotten there, uh, Don, who is the armorer there at Tactical Response, wanted to conduct a headspace test. We had no hand in the setup of the headspace test, but I understood what he was attempting to do. He only had a no-go gauge. I asked him when, when he brought the no-go gauge out if he had a field gauge, which is a true test of headspace, uh, and whether or not a gun is truly dangerous to fire or not, and he said he did not. He just had a no-go gauge, which is used in manufacturing. But if a gun fails a no-go gauge in manufacturing, it shouldn't be shipped, it should be fixed. So even though a no-go gauge doesn't necessarily mean the gun is horridly out of headspace and it's become dangerous, if you see that headspace growing, in this case over the span of 500 rounds, that could be a very bad sign. You probably want to stop testing. So we, what he did is he, instead of taking the extractor and firing pin out of the bolt and doing the test properly like this for the sake of expediency, because we only had that afternoon and we had set up, I think around noonish or so to start filming, he wanted to expedite the testing process. So we would fire 500 rounds, do a headspace test, fire 500 rounds, do a headspace test, do a 500 rounds. And so he didn't take the extractor claw out he would just simply drop the no-go gauge in and then let the bolt go closed. He'd take a roll of tape and tap the charging handle to try to get the extractor rim to pop over the rim of the no-go gauge just to do a quick test of the headspace. Again, not ideal, but I understand why he was doing it that way. So anyway, the first rifle, before the testing even started, Don said, I'm going to do a headspace test on these two guns just to make sure we have a baseline. The first gun failed the headspace test. It had fired 1,000 rounds. He put the no-go gauge in it, and it failed the test. He tapped the gun muzzle down on the ground and ran the headspace test again with the no-go gauge, and the second time, it passed the no-go test. So the barrel was moving in that front trunnion. That's a very bad thing. So we talked, and I said, man, I, I don't think, and they had a bunch of students there that were going to be the trigger pullers. I said, I don't think this is a good idea. Uh, to use this gun, and Don agreed because it would seem that there was a uh, some sort of a catastrophic failure of either the barrel being pressed in the front trunnion or the barrel pin that holds the barrel in place. Something was giving and moving, and that is indicative of a very dangerous situation. So the decision was made to go with the one that was new in the box and had not yet been fired. Meanwhile, while everything was getting set up, Don took the first RAS-47 that was failing the no-go test over to a plastic 55-gallon drum barrel had a, a simple punch and a hammer, and he just tapped the barrel pin out. Oh, oh, oh shit. Okay, got it. Hey. Right out. Hey, it popped okay. straight it out. It came right out. Going on, all right, here. all right, guys. Open so you just whacked it with a on a, on a plastic drum. On a plastic drum, that barrel pin is pushing right out. So that's um. That's concerning. And that, guys, is extremely bad. That should take over a ton of pressure to press fit that pin into the trunnion, which holds the barrel into the trunnion. You should not be able to drive that out with a hammer. You should need a press to push that pin out. Many times it'll, you'll apply so much pressure that it will pop as it breaks that pin loose from friction forces. Tapping it out with a hammer is a no-go. That's very bad. And we noticed that the pin had walked inside the trunnion, which is why Don tried to knock it around a little bit with a punch. So that gun was definitely dangerous. So the testing began. Now, if you watch the entire footage down below, if you're looking for failures to feed or any type of malfunction, the gun doesn't have any malfunctions in 1,500 rounds. And that's the, ex the entire duration of the test. Because the, the gun, the first gun had failed at 1,000 rounds, Originally, the plan was to test the headspace every 1,000 rounds, let the gun cool down, load up magazines. So that changed to every 500 rounds that they wanted to do the no-go test. So the gun had more cool down time. Now, some of the guys I've seen post on Jaeger's video, um, no gun was designed to be fired that much, which is utter and complete nonsense. Anybody would say that doesn't know anything about firearms. If you watch the testing, you'll notice that the wood never discolors. It doesn't start to burn. 
the guns were never, or the test gun was never allowed to get so hot that it would be an unfair test. Okay, the gun was allowed to cool, the cadence of fire was very slow, with the exception of my mag dump, and so the gun didn't get overly hot. And so that's, that's simply not a factor in all this. So the second gun, no malfunctions. We did notice erratic ejection. If you watch Rob Ski's video uh, of, of his, I think he's up to 2,500 rounds now so far through his Vishka testing, he's having malfunction after malfunction. And it seems to be attributed to the fact that the gun's erratic ejection, sometimes the spent case just barely falls out of the ejection port. Other times it heaves it to the next zip code. That erratic ejection seems to be causing him malfunctions. It did not cause the test rifle malfunctions, but we did note that it was, was occurring during the testing. So if you're gonna watch that video, you're not gonna see any malfunctions. It culminates at the end after 1500 rounds, testing every 500 rounds, the headspace, at 1500 rounds, the second rifle failed a no-go test. So from 1000 to 1500 rounds, 500 rounds were fired. It was in headspace to 500 rounds later, which is very fast being out of headspace, the testing was stopped because the headspace was expanding so, so rapidly. Uh, I would imagine another 500 rounds and it probably swallowed, would have swallowed a field gauge, which then would mean the gun was very dangerous. Once again, we took that second rifle and popped it on the ground, muzzle down, put a no-go test gauge in it, and lo and behold, that second gun passed a no-go test. Once again, the barrel seems to have been moving in that front trunnion, which was Again, within 1,500 rounds, that's extremely bad and dangerous. Once again, Don tapped on that barrel pin and it started to drift out. So both guns failed within 1,000 to 1,500 rounds. We also noticed that in the course of firing, uh, most of, all the firing I believe was done from the shoulder except for me when I, I fired that first magazine and we noticed that the stock was coming loose, which is something that we've seen in the RES-47, the wood screw on this top tang, this is the only wood screw in the gun, there's not one on the bottom. This starts to get, uh, for lack of a better term, wallered out, <laughs> and the wood screw uh, will just eventually just pull out and the stock will come off the gun, and there's nothing you can do to repair that. You can go um, perhaps with a larger screw, which will require you to drill out this tang, or to put some sort of hard filler in there and re-screw in the screw, or just replace this furniture. But the point being is that this wood appears to be just as soft and likely to fail as the RES 47's wood furniture, which is noted to crack and fall out and break um, with use as well. Stock's getting loose. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, stock is loose. That's not, that's not a new problem though, those wooden stocks. <laughs> so overall, it doesn't seem as though there's been any improvements that we could measure based upon that testing of the Vishka rifle. And, and based upon what I saw with those two rifles at that event, I have concerns with the safety of firing the RS-47 once you get up into high round counts. I have the same concern with the Vishka rifle that if you're buying an AK, to actually use, this is not gonna be your best option based on what we've seen so far. This gun fails very, very quickly and uh, it becomes dangerous in my opinion very, very quickly, too, too quickly. These AKs should be able to take 40, 50,000 rounds before a part breaks, much less going in or out of headspace. Uh, you should never see that barrel move, you should never see that barrel pin come out. I've never seen that on a uh, import AK, Wasser, Bulgarian, Russian, whatever. So, my assessment of the Vishka rifle is that um, I, I can't recommend it. This gun needs more work. I would say that this gun has not improved upon the original RES-47. If anything, it's a step backwards. There's fewer features. And it seems that this gun, at least in the testing that was done down at James's, uh, would seem to indicate that it wears out even more quickly. And then I have the concerns about the barrel not being nitrided or chrome plated as well. So. Guys, I, I, I would not recommend picking this rifle up. I don't know if Century can resolve the issues. I know that they contacted James um, and, and said that they're gonna come down and see if they can get the issues resolved. I hope they get it worked out, but I'm not optimistic given this is their second crack at it. They knew the issues with the RES-47. They built the Vishka presumably to resolve some of those issues or to harden the design. And it seems like they've accomplished the exact opposite, at least based upon my experiences so far. Now, this is a brand new rifle and we will take this rifle out and shoot it. This is a brand new RAS-47. We'll go out and do a comparison of our own once Rob Ski is done with his testing. Uh, his testing seems to be going a little bit better. His, his stock 
he said, I think it's just a little bit loose, but not coming loose as fast as he had seen in the previously. Uh, he's not having the problems with the gun going out of headspace. He's checking the headspace. So his gun seems to be behaving differently than the two test rifles we had down in Camden. And so we're going to see what happens with this one. So we're going to let everybody else do their testing, which the only person out there I know that does real testing is Rob. We'll let him finish up, and then we're going to take these two guns out ourselves and see at what point they begin to fail. Headspace tests or other parts start to fail. I also wanted to note that on the test rifle at, um, at James Yeager's place, the tail on the bolt carrier, which is when the, when the gun fires, it comes back and this pushes the hammer back and then should, it also acts as a safety. If the hammer should follow the bolt carrier home, it would prevent the gun from firing. But this is what impacts the hammer as the bolt carrier goes rearward. Uh, his, his was peening pretty severely. By the end of 1,500 rounds, we noticed severe peening on the tail of the carrier. And I'll post a picture showing you that. We also noticed some premature wear on one of the lugs on the bolt. I'll, I'll show you a picture of that, which seems to mirror some of the wear that we see on Rob Ski's test rifle as well. So it would, it would seem that, uh, that the bolt is peening, at least in one area, consistently across multiple rifles. We also noted on the test rifle at James's place that over here, we I can't tell if it's a casting flaw that just got polished by the, the gun action cycling or what on the, on the trunnion, but we saw almost no lug engagement on the lug on this side of the rifle. It seemed that all, all the pressure was being absorbed by the lug on the right-hand side of the rifle. This is a problem we've seen with the C39V2 and the RAS47, and it seemed that there's either a casting flaw or a crack that appeared in the trunnion on this locking lug. We could feel it, we could see it, but uh, my, my old eyes, I couldn't really make it out. I did take a picture. I'll roll it in and let you guys determine. I don't have that rifle here to do further, further inspection. So I don't know if it's a crack or a casting flaw that just got polished or what, but it definitely started to appear on the front trunnion, that locking lug. And it does not seem that we have equal engagement on both locking lugs in the trunnion, which, as I mentioned previously, is a consistent problem with previous Century Arms AKs. All right, guys, so that's it. If you want to continue to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, the best way to do that is to become a Patreon supporter. This rifle we purchased through RSR, which is a distributor. We were contacted by Century Arms. They offered to send us an AK. I said, no, thank you. We'll just pick one up through distribution so that we can see what is actually being shipped through distribution to end users versus running the chance, and I'm not saying that Century would do this, but sending us a hand-picked rifle that would pass our testing. We'd rather just get it through distribution through a gun shop just like you guys would so we can see what the actual production guns look like and take out that variable of a manufacturer perhaps handpicking a rifle for our testing. Again, I'm not saying Century would do that or that was their intent, but we didn't accept the free rifle. So um, we'll, we'll get back to you on this. The Patreon support allows us to do that. And if you wanna support us, link down below consider becoming a Patreon supporter because it allows us to do this impartial testing and report back to you with our actual results. Another great way to support us here at the Military Arms Channel is to pick up a cool shirt like this CZ with the classic CZ logo from our Forge from Freedom store. Again, a link down below. Click that and support us here at the Military Arms Channel. Also, you might be surprised to find out that me and Jason and some of the other guys here at Copper Custom are gamers. And so we're starting to Twitch, okay? Yes, at 50 years old, I'm Twitch streaming. So if you guys would like to follow us on Twitch, there is a link down below. Please do so and join us on some of our live streams. And um, right now we're playing Battlefield 5 and we'll probably play some Battlefield 4 and maybe some Titanfall and some other stuff that we find interesting. And last but not least, guys, please swing by and check us out at Copper Custom, which is our online store. Thanks for 10 years of support and we'll talk to you guys soon.